Our last speaker probably doesn't need much of an introduction, Alan Jurek uh, from WIRE, and uh, Chief Technology Officer and uh, CEO as well. So first, what I would like uh, to talk is a bit about privacy from a macro perspective, uh, because it is, in my opinion, uh, very important uh, also uh, to understand the some of the reasons uh, why GDPR has been made. Uh, and if you look beginning of uh, our century, 2000s, uh, we started uh, tackling damages uh, of uh, passive smoke. Uh, and there's been uh, put way more attention to smoking and all of the hazards that secondhand smoking or a passive smoking is causing. And why I'm talking about this? Because when I was a kid in 70s and 80s, awareness of the damages and hazards of a passive smoke strikingly reminds me on lack of awareness of our privacy exploitation. And there is a number of things that we can compare there. And uh, if you are looking uh, from today's perspective, uh, we know about the damages that passive smoking is <coughs> causing. But it wasn't like that before. You see, those are some of the commercials from 50s, uh, 60s, even similar was in the 70s. So more doctors smoke camels and uh, it is a good for a baby's smoke. Yeah, it, it is funny and it's, it's ridiculous when you look at it uh, from today's perspective. But what I'm worried is that my daughter is not going to look upon a certain things where I had to raise their awareness about the privacy and exploitation of her privacy in the same way as I'm questioning my parents. Because, you know, when I was a kid, uh, during the 70s, uh, we kids were playing uh, games. That was uh, pre-PlayStation and uh, pre-Xbox time. Uh, so we had a cardboard games or uh, just the simple games. Uh, and our parents were playing cards and smoking in the same room where we kids were playing. Why? Because, you know, they didn't know better. And also, there was uh, quite a bit of a media fuss, lobbying, large massive corporations. Do you see the pattern as well with the privacy? Just some of those uh, companies at that time uh, were called uh, uh, BAT, like British American Tobacco. Today they are called with the F's, G's, M's, etc. And then once when uh, some of the research and some of the knowledge about hazards of a passive smoking started popping up, then uh, my parents said, like, we are not smoking anymore at home. There is no smoking anymore in the car. Imagine smoking in the car with the kids. That's what I passed, and that's uh, what the kids born in the 70s have passed. Even kids born in the 80s. And then, as there is more of a data and more of a regulation coming out so that uh, people were not allowed uh, to smoke any, anymore at work or were not allowed to smoke uh, where people are eating, etc., coming out, then parents also picked up and seen uh, it's maybe a good thing uh, that we don't smoke anymore. But of course, it left quite a bit of impact on their health. So, 
what we were seeing in uh, 2000 and beginning of 2000s was like a massive fines for tobacco industry due to abuses that can be compared, I think, in the same way with the privacy. And what Katrina said, I fully agree with it. The uh, only way to change the things and to enforce things is uh, by fines. Mm -hmm. If you don't find someone, but it's not like, you know, finding uh, uh, 100 plus uh, billion corporation with uh, 200,000 euros fine. It's a joke, uh, just the legal cost uh, for them would be a way bigger to get into any discussion, so it's easy for them to pay. But now with the GDPR, for the first time, those fines are getting magnitudes bigger, and uh, there is a pity that there is a cap on, uh, on the amount. Uh, so it goes with a percentage, but there is a cap on the amount there. And uh, let's see if you are going to see those, uh, not multi-trillion, but okay, multi-million fines for the F's, G's, and M's coming forward, because GDPR and the data protection should not be, and it's not only about protecting, about, uh, protecting uh, situations where data loss uh, happens because of negligence or not knowing better, but also should be for a misuse of your private data, even if there was no data breach. Because there is no difference, and it's in, in a number of cases it's a less harmful, though it's, it's a bit obscure to talk about it, but it's a less, less harmful if uh, some of the data that goes out uh, from uh, telecom players or other companies uh, that we've seen in the past comes out, then uh, what are the uh, potential uh, damages and hazards of uh, exploitation of uh, your data without any data breach. And there was also glad uh, to hear that Telefonica is the one that started moving there because I've been also for a number of years in a telecom sector and uh, we've been collecting all of that data because uh, there was a saying uh, that uh, all of this is a uh, gold mine and that data from users is the oil of a new economy. And then what I was witnessing uh, in the telecom sector for 15 years was that data was not used for almost anything useful, would dare to say, or hardly anything useful. And it was just staying there waiting for a summon to exploit it. So that's also why I like to compare this data or a metadata or any kind of your private data to a nuclear waste. If you are collecting it and uh, not, not using it, because you know, sometimes there is a, some metadata that you need to use. And uh, at wire, we use it because this is something that improves uh, functionality of wire. For we, so we need a tiny bit of a metadata in order to enable uh, multi device support, proper multi device support on wire. But you need also to be prudent about it and then uh, delete it when, uh, when, when you don't need it. And this is, this is something what will take mentality shift for a number of companies that are sitting on this data and not really doing anything. Because now with a GDPR, they know that this is liability, that this is becoming their nuclear waste. And that they can pay severe fines for that. When we are looking things from the data, perspective uh, 
I like there to look, of course, uh, the field that I'm in, and uh, this is the uh, communication space and uh, social networking space, messaging space. Uh, and why GDPR is important. Yet another reason is because when you look social network perspective, Europe is the only one that doesn't have a massive one. Everyone else has it. And uh, we know that it's way harder to get a grasp on what's happening within those territories that are outside of EU. And especially then, when there comes a dispute situation, experience there is not the best. Looking there, it's needless to stress all of the risks of uh, EU private data being outside of EU. And this is why GDPR is also important because it's addressing up to a pretty good extent this issue. And uh, <coughs> other thing that is important to uh, this is, as mentioned, uh, enforcing any kind of uh, laws on those companies that are outside of EU, it's, it's quite difficult. And what's even worse is that similar thing is happening on the business side and uh, with a shadow IT, what's up being used my personal situation on a Tegel airport where uh, my wife purse looks a bit difficult uh, so the handle can be also uh, seen as a weapon and security personnel they were debating for a couple of minutes if this can go in the airplane or not and then what is happening? Next, think, shock. They are taking a photo of her passport, taking a photo of this purse, sending it with a WhatsApp somewhere back. This is German police. And if this is happening in Germany, you can imagine what's happening in the rest of the European countries. So needless, to say how important it is that this shadow ITCs to exist and that the cases like this one are being properly sanctioned. Because one of the first things what GDPR tells you is uh, that there shouldn't be a upload and storage of uh, address book. And what's happening first thing uh, when you install your WhatsApp? You upload your address book. And then of course it is further being uh, matched with your Facebook account. And the whole story goes on there. And if this is done by German police officer, it's something what's, what's very serious. And needless to say there that uh, industrial espionage is real and uh, this is something uh, what's extremely to protect not only in Europe but uh, elsewhere but especially in Europe. Weakest link of the chain uh, email. How many of you are still using email uh, for, uh, let's say, serious business uh, communication? Uh, see, pretty much everyone, uh, everyone uh, in the room. And 97% of people, so here is maybe roughly 100 of us uh, 
So uh, three of us uh, would be able uh, to uh, spot the fishing male. It's uh, one of them uh, is Sebastian there and uh, Raphael, uh, our guy. Maybe, maybe this room has a couple of more people than what is the uh, usual percentage. But a number of those exploits are happening through email. And 30% of those phishing messages get opened by targeted users. And then 12% are going to click. Uh, so you see some of the biggest exploits that happened in the last year and also that uh, brought multi-billion damage to Maesk and a number of other companies around Europe came by clicking stuff uh, from employees what they shouldn't be clicking. And uh, if you look further, Gartner source through 2020, yeah, email is still primary targeting uh, me to get those exploits. And one and a half billion people uh, is going to be affected with this, according uh, to IDC. So, needless to say, uh, for a sensitive work information, not, not only for the uh, efficiency reasons, uh, email is way beyond communication tools, messaging tools, etc., but for potential data breaches, how they are going to happen. The easiest, the softest target is email server. And we've seen it uh, during the uh, US election campaign uh, and uh, during the number of other situations where this should have not happened, it still happened there. And uh, if you look there, one third of consumers uh, would stop dealing with a business after a security breach happens. So it's not only the GDPR fine is going to hit those businesses. They are going to also lose a lot of customers. And if you see, for instance, uh, Deloitte hit by cyber attack, and uh, they are also the one that was saying email should not be used uh, for sensitive communication uh, some weeks uh, after they are being uh, hit, and super sensitive data of all of their customers is out. So those also that are preaching the story are not really uh, executing it. And uh, if you see some other interesting cases when email is used, where it shouldn't be used. And the uh, situation is not, not much better with uh, business messaging tools that are not deploying the highest grade of uh, security standards, because it's basically the same, <coughs> same, uh, same risk as it is uh, with the email server, or maybe, maybe a little bit, little bit better, but a still a still very similar game. So here, what is really important is that with the solutions that are deploying end-to-end -end encryption, the encryption keys are on your side, on the subjects of uh, communication, the ones that you are exchanging sensitive information, not in the core of the network. And there we can say like, you know, Wire, we are great, great guys, you see we have a nice office, uh, we are nice people, uh, we are not going to be abusing your data. You don't have to trust us on that because uh, technology is the one that uh, should make sure that it doesn't happen. You've seen also with a Twitter where an employee kicked out US president. Not like it was a bad thing to do, but uh, <laughs> it, is, it is still something what should not happen. And this is continuously happening if there is a mean for exploit like this uh, to happen. It is only a question of time when it will happen. So, there we'll talk a little bit about the EU Grown alternative. So, with a wire, using Simon Sinek's language, start with a Y, 
why for us is protecting your essential data and shielding your digital privacy. How we do it? We do it by using uh, the best possible uh, technologies, encryption, high definition, uh, audio, video, sound, and everything delivering the highest experience without sacrificing on uh, usability or security. Because we've seen what is happening uh, when systems that are used that might even be secure, if they are very hard uh, to use, then shadow IT kicks in and then the trouble starts. And what today we have a great uh, messaging tool and the collaboration suite for uh, consumers and businesses. And uh, as uh, uh, mentioned uh, by Jan, uh, uh, we need also to start looking at uh, how the privacy is uh, further going into the uh, world of machines and communication, human to machine and uh, machine to machine. So this is exactly some of the next steps that we are doing. And then once when you have this in your core, it's easy to address any of the new growing verticals when you are following uh, certain principles and then when you have this privacy and security uh, built by design. So <coughs> there also just as a reference, uh, it's, it's not only good good enough uh, to say we have this, uh, this is the best and the greatest uh, or this is, as it's number of times referred, uh, military grade encryption. Whenever you hear military grade encryption, beware of that. Uh, <laughs> check rather if it's open source, uh, how transparent it is and also who has audited that solution. When was the last time audited? What was audited? Was it audited uh, only specification or was it audited the implementation that is running? So there, when you do things uh, like that, also comes uh, some more recognition uh, from people that are uh, true privacy uh, activists. Uh, they, they may be disputed uh, by someone, but uh, they are the benchmark, at least uh, for our team. And extremely important there, mentioned uh, by other panelists, uh, full transparency and uh, there I like to say that uh, our terms of use and the privacy policy is written uh, by ordinary people or normal people that are in the company and then it is checked uh, by our lawyers that we didn't put anything super stupid there but it's only checked, it's used still the same language, it's a super short and it's meant to be understood by any of our users. It's not written by lawyers for lawyers. And this is something what needs to change. And this is something uh, where us and you in this room need uh, to make a difference because we need to raise awareness. We are the ones uh, that uh, are opinion makers and we are the ones uh, that are being asked by our families and friends. And if uh, people do not demand uh, different privacy policies and different terms of use, not much is going to happen there. So GDPR is the one again that helps quite a lot there. So just to wrap it up, uh, two words about wire and uh, messaging solution and the collaboration suite uh, for uh, consumers and the businesses uh, within the same application, you can uh, have the both spaces similar as you would have uh, with email uh, and available for download uh, on any of those platforms. Uh, uh, we'd love to get your feedback about it and uh, to get to know how we can make it better. And the ones uh, that helped us a lot uh, to make uh, Wire better privacy tool and better security tool are exactly our users. And from beginning, We've done also a number of mistakes and our first privacy policy was written from lawyers by, uh, uh, for lawyers, <laughs> from lawyers, for lawyers. And we've been hammered in the media. So it was, it was a good learning experience and we improved it. So in the same way, uh, if you see some other stuff uh, where we can improve, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback and uh, hear more. So a couple of uh, closing 
remarks, uh, there needs to be uh, for businesses uh, ceased usage of uh, shadow <coughs> IT, stop using email uh, for your uh, sensitive uh, uh, information and uh, uh, sensitive company data and lead by example, uh, not like Deloitte that is talking one thing uh, and then doing something uh, totally different. Uh, so uh, it's my favorite author, uh, William Gibson says uh, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Thank you.